who are distinguished by baptizing professing believers only. Are you with me? That as Baptists, the key thing is that we only baptize people who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And that is the opposite of some other denominations who do infant baptism. And so you'll notice that in the Baptist church, we don't do infant baptism, but we rather do child dedication. So when the child is born, the, the parent decide to come to the church the first time, we do a child dedication and not baptism. And our emphasis is the fact that the Bible says in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, 19, 18 to 20, that we should go into all the world, preach the gospel, and those who believe, we should baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then we teach them to observe all that the Lord has commanded us. So Baptists believe that baptism comes only after somebody has become born again. Amen? Praise the Lord. And then the second thing about this baptism is that we believe that baptism is by immersion. In other words, the person must be buried fully in water. So Baptists don't accept sprinkling, neither do we accept any pouring of water on somebody casually. But we accept full immersion in water. And the Bible says that we are buried with Christ and we rise up in newness of life in him. And so when we are baptizing, we put you in the water to make sure that you are fully buried in the water. And so in uh, Baptist baptism, we send the people backwards instead of bringing them forward. Are you with me? As if we are burying you. We put you all the way into the water to make sure that the water has covered you fully. And then we bring you back. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. So that is one distinct thing that distinguishes Baptist church from any other church. So in most Baptist churches, and sometimes as you see, we throw an invitation for those who want to accept Christ to walk forward. Other times, we we'll make an invitation for those who want to join the church to step forward. And then, when you come to accept Christ, we take you through a period of teaching, and then after that, you go through the period of baptism. And so, Baptists are distinct in terms of those belief. I'll say a little bit more about that later. The second thing is that historians trace the earliest Baptist church to have started in 1609 in Amsterdam in the, in the Dutch Republic. And this was done with first one English separatist who, who, who was called John Smith as a pastor. Now when I talk about separatists, you know that the church several years ago used to be only one. It used to be the Catholic Church. And then there was some revolt that separated the Anglicans from the Catholic Church. And so England had the Church of England. And during some of the periods of the Reformation, as people studied the word of God, they came to certain truths and realized that, look, we separated from the Catholics because they were doing things like purgatory and ablutions and uh, what indulgences, you pay your way to get to heaven. And then as we study scripture, some of them realize, no, we don't do those things. The Bible says that salvation is by grace alone. And so they separated from the Catholic Church. Then the Anglican Church, which was the Church of England, did not fully let go of some of the Catholic things. So they were still practicing some of these. Then there were some people who felt like, look, in our study of scripture, this is not what we are seeing. So they also broke off. There was some persecution. Some of them left England and went to Holland. To stay there. And while they were there, this first group began with John Smith as the pastor. And as I said, through the reading of the text of the New Testament scripture, John Smith rejected baptism of infants and instituted baptism only for believing Christians. And when we were in Amsterdam about a month ago, we went to look at one river where some of the people who advocated for some of these things were killed. Sorry, in, in Zurich, sorry. 
some of them were killed because of uh, their beliefs. And so from Amsterdam, Baptist practice spread and then went back to England again. They carried the message back. But when they got to England and began to spread the Baptist faith, two groups emerged out of the Baptists. One is what we call the General Baptists. And the General Baptists believe that the atonement of Christ or the death of Christ is for all people. That anybody who believed in the Lord could be saved. There was another group that was called the Particular Baptists. And they believed that salvation is by election and predestination. So until God specifically calls you, you can't be born again. Are you with me? So these two groups emerge, the General Baptist and then also the Particular Baptist. And then there was a gentleman called him Thomas Hewes. He then formulated distinctive Baptist demands that the church and the state should be kept separate. That the Church of England had control over the church and the Anglican church was the state church. And if we are Baptists and we have become Christians, there should be a separation between the church and the state. So no link. Let the church stand on its own. Let the state stand on its own. Give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and give unto God what belongs to God. Hallelujah. And then because of this, he was imprisoned. John Hayworth was in, imprisoned. And finally, he was, he was killed uh, because he lived under dissent under King James I. Then in 1639, Roger Williams established the first Baptist congregation in the North American colonies. So they also migrated from England and went to America and began the Baptist faith there. Are you with me? So you have a group of people who left England, went to Amsterdam, brought the faith back to England. Some of them were persecuted. Some of them left England and went to America. Are you with me? Now, for most people, the impression we have is that Baptist faith began in America. But I'm telling you that that is not the case. A group of people came first from England, went to Amsterdam, took the gospel back to England. Then finally, it, left, it, it ended in America. Then in between the 18th and the 19th centuries, there was what we call the first great awakening. And that first wake, great awakening began to cause a massive evolution in America when a lot of people began, began to become members of the church in the United States. And this first great awakening, or sometimes they call it the evangelical revival, was a series of Christian revivals that swept Great Britain and all its colonies. And then in 19, sorry, 1730 and the 1740s, this was a great reawakening. When the gospel was preached everywhere, a lot of people became born again. The gospel began to spread. The persecution also be became intense because the more people accepted the gospel and defied the Church of England, persecution became stronger. And some of them migrated and left there and went to America and all to be begin the work there. Hallelujah. Now, this great awakening also marked the emergence of what we call the Anglo-American evangelism. That brought about transdenominational movement within the Protestant churches. So when it got to this level, instead of purely staying as an Anglican or this or that, the great awakening swept through. People became born again. Now, denominational barriers were, as it were, broken. Let's see ourselves as Christians who believe in these things more than being part of a denomination. Hallelujah. Then, in the U.S., the term Great Awakening is sometimes referred to as the Evangelical Revival. And when this began, America then began to send missionaries to other parts of the world. And especially the Southern Baptists became very strong in terms of their missionary outreach and began to spread the gospel all over the world. Let me not go too much into this. My goal is to whip your appetite. Uh, Pastor Charles has told us there's too much information on the internet. You can go and read. Hallelujah. So let me narrow down to Ghana Baptist Convention. What is our history? I must say that 
just as I said in the beginning, a lot of people in Ghana think that the Baptist faith began with the Southern Baptist Convention members from the U.S. But that is not the case. Baptist work in Ghana began with Nigerian traders who were trading along the West African coast around 1920. And those of us who are a little bit older, and I know what I'm talking about, saw so, Mami Alata and Papa Alata all over the country at the time. And they had all the shops, small, small shops in all our villages across our streets and everywhere. And as the Nigerian traders came into Ghana and did their business of trading, and now we are saying that probably there are about, maybe about one million Nigerians in Ghana. I don't know how many they were because there were a lot more in those days than what we see here. They came also with their gospel. And so, as these traders traded and moved from place to place, over the weekends, they will congregate in some of their homes because they didn't have churches. And then they, some of them congregated in their shops and also in other public places and in their garages. And that was where they were worshipping. And they did this over time. And with time, these Nigerian Baptist congregations were scattered across the country. If you go to some of our rural communities, uh, you go to Kade, you go to Akwetia, you go to Dunkwao, and you will still see very old Baptist churches that were built by these Nigerians. So they began to grow. But the truth is that at that time, the membership of the Baptist churches were basically Yoruba Nigerians who were here. In 1940, they began to realize that they needed to congregate and strengthen themselves a lot more. And also to find some means to make the Baptist faith stronger. So in 1940, the then Yoruba Baptist Association, which was the group of Baptists who were in Ghana, wrote a letter to the Nigerian Baptist Mission asking them to send missionary couples to Ghana to work with them in Ghana. 1940. This letter received response in 1947. Seven years down the line. Now, some of us are wondering, what, is, what was wrong with them? Because now you know airplanes between Ghana and Nigeria is how many minutes? One hour you are there. By road you leave in the morning, and late afternoon you are here. That was not the case in those days. <laughs> if you sat in the ship, <laughs> I don't know how many days it took us to get there. So it took them seven years. So in 1947, the Nigerian Baptist Convention sent Reverend J. Udo and his family as field workers for the entire Yoruba Baptist Association to work with them in the then Gold Coast. And for you, those of us who are growing now, you know that Ghana used to be called the Gold Coast. So the Yoruba Association in those days <laughs> came to work in the then Gold Coast. So they came on February 9th in 1947. A few days after that, which was February 17th, then they sent association, the Baptist Mission in Nigeria, then sent another Reverend Minister, H.L. Littleton, and his family, who worked as volunteers, came from Nigeria to work with the then Gold Coast in response to the request that the, Nigerian, uh, the Yoruba Association had sent to Nigeria. So these missionaries came to Ghana, and when they came, their first station was to go to Kumasi. Amen? Amen. As I said, in those days, there were no Ghanaians in those churches. These were purely Yoruba Nigerians who were here. So the goal of the Littletons and the goal of Reverend Udowu and the family, these two families who came, was to see how best they could work among the Yorubas who were here and also find another means to penetrate, to get through, to get some Ghanaians to become members of the Baptist faith. In 1963, between 47 and 63, 
the Ghana Baptist Conference, the Nigerian Baptist Association, the Europe Baptist Association, which was here, had changed the name to become the Nigerian uh, Europe Baptist Association, changed its name to become the Ghana Baptist Conference. But in 1963, that name was being changed again. And in 64, the name changed to become the Ghana Baptist Convention. And still at that time, there were very few Ghanaians who were in those churches because the Nigerians dominated. I don't know if you've ever visited any of the Nigerian churches in Accra. There's still one here which is very typical. Marquis Ford Baptist Church. Uh, what's that place? Abobloshi. The Tima Market. When you go to Tima Market, there's still, there's still a church. There's a very large congregation. I was invited to go and preach there once. And apart from the time I preached, when I had interpretation, all the service was in Yoruba. So I sat in there and heard all my tongues. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Kumar said there's another one, First Baptist Church in Akotia Line. It's also an, a full uh, Yoruba church. When you go there, everything is in Yoruba. And, uh, so they have still remained as pure Nigerian churches. In 1969, something happened in this country. The government passed a law, uh, which was the Aliens Compliance Order, which was also called the Quit Order, asking all immigrants in this country who were here without proper permit to leave the country. So when this happened, it meant that everybody, any foreigner who lived in this country who did not have the right immigration paper was supposed to go. And if you look at the number of Nigerians who were here as traders in those days when this quit order came, it was a disaster. Some left without even telling us where the churches were because there were very few Ghanaians then. They left, they left the churches, they left everything, some left their businesses. I mean, it was a very short window, and people had to leave. It was like uh, Israel leaving e Egypt. <laughs> if you were young, old in those days to see what happened, it was very terrible. It was almost the same like Israel leaving Egypt. A short period of time, everybody was supposed to leave. And so they left. Now, this affected a lot of Nigerians. A lot of their shops and their businesses were closed. And when the Nigerians were leaving, the churches that were planted were handed into the hands of the few Ghanaians who were in those churches. I went to Grace Baptist Church a little bit of the beginning. When I joined Grace Baptist Church, I don't think we were more than 35. It was a very small congregation. Nigerians had left and given us that big building. And the history of that building is another story. <laughs> if I talk about that, that will also take us another, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of time. And so there were very few Ghanaians who were in those churches. But the Quit Order also weakened the Ghana Baptist Convention. Because the Nigerians were the majority. They had the resources, they had the personnel, and they had everything. So when they left, the convention suddenly became very weak because we didn't have the resources to do what we wanted to do. But the exit of the Nigerians also helped the Ghana Baptist Convention to change the perception because in those days, everybody thought that Baptist was an Yoruba church. And that was the reason why most people didn't want to go there because if you went there, you didn't understand anything that was being said. It's just like when some of our foreigners come to our churches and go to somewhere where we are only speaking chi, and they sit in there, they are lost. That was exactly the opposite of what was happening in those days. So when they left, the few Ghanaians took over, and now we had to change the perception that the Baptist church was no longer not an Yoruba church, but the Baptist church had a universal, uh, was a universal uh, denomination. Hallelujah. So that is how we came into being. And so from that time, the Baptist Church has gone through different phases to bring us to where we are. And now the Ghana Baptist Convention is heavily Ghanaian dominated. Hallelujah. 
Amen. So that's a little bit of background. There are too many stories in between. But if I want to talk about those stories, we will not live here. Uh, all of them have their history. And uh, I was talking about the Grace Baptist Church and where the Grace Baptist Church building is. Some of you go to Kumasi and see that's a very nice church. But that place used to be a baller. Are you with me? It used to be, that's where Kumasi people used to dump their refuse. It was a dumping ground. And nobody wanted it. But the Nigerians then said they wanted that land. So they had to take the land, reclaim it, and do all the things to put up the building that was there. And when I became a Baptist and went there, it was one of the best church buildings we had in Kumasi. Hallelujah. But it was built on a refuse dump. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So who are we as Baptists? And what do we believe in? Let me ad admit that one presentation is not enough to talk about all the things we believe in. But what I'm doing this morning is to help you to do further study and to look at some of the things that we believe in. I'll talk about first the basic Christian beliefs which we all uphold. And then I'll come to what we call the Baptist distinctives to make the separation. Because if I talk about the distinctives alone, you ask me too many questions. But what about this and what about that? So there are basic beliefs of Christendom. Number one, we believe that there is only one God. Amen? Amen. How many gods? Only one. only one God. And that is as a basis in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10, Isaiah 44, verse 6 and 8, John's Gospel chapter 17, verse 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 5 to 6, Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 to 9. You'll find all these things there that this one God is also omnipresent. Amen? Amen? In other words, it's a God who is present everywhere. Jeremiah 23, 23, 20, and 24 talks about that. He is also omniscient. In other words, he's a God who knows all things. He is God omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He is God who is sovereign. He is sovereign in himself. He is God by himself. He does not need anybody to prove who he is. Hallelujah. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, we believe that this God is holy. He is the creator of everything that exists. In Galatians, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, Isaiah 44, 24. He is infinite and eternal. He has always been and he will forever be. Hallelujah. He is God who is immutable. In other words, he does not change. Hallelujah. So we believe that there's only one God, and this one God has all these attributes that I've shared. Number two, the church believes that the Bible is the word of God. The Bible is God's divinely inspired revelation of himself to humankind. It is true, it is trustworthy, and it's without error. Amen? Amen? The Bible is the equipping tool, providing doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction so that every believer may be equipped for every good work. And the Bible is the ultimate authority in shaping a person's life. Hallelujah. So that is what we believe about the Bible. Number three, we believe that all humans have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3 verse 23. That death came into the world through Adam's sin in Romans 5 and sin separates humankind from God. Amen? All humans have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. Number four, we believe that there is heaven and there is hell. And people who fail to recognize God as the one and only are sentenced to, eternal, eterni sentenced to eternity in hell. We believe that hell is a place of punishment according to Matthew 25, verse 41 and 46. We believe that hell is eternal. We believe that those who reject Jesus Christ after they die will go to hell forever. According to Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15, and then chapter 21, verse 8. 
that those who accept Jesus Christ after they die will live for eternity with him. Hallelujah. John's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 25, 26. Second Corinthians, chapter 5, and verse 6. Five, we believe that salvation is through Jesus Christ alone. Salvation is through Jesus Christ alone. And the only way to get to heaven is salvation through Christ. And to achieve salvation, one must confess faith in God who sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for the sins of mankind. That it is only through faith and belief that Jesus died for mankind and that he is the one and only God through whom people gain entrance into heaven. Amen. Amen. The salvation is through Jesus Christ and he alone. Number six, we believe that Jesus is coming again. We believe in the literal second coming of Christ when God will judge and divide between the saved and the lost and Christ will judge believers, rewarding them for acts done while they live on this earth. Jesus is coming again. That the Lord will return, Jesus will return to the earth according to Acts chapter 1, verse 11. The angel told the apostles, this Jesus whom you see going will come in the same manner. Hallelujah. And that when he comes, Christians will be raised from the dead. According to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14 to 16. That there will be final judgment when Jesus comes again. According to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. That when Jesus comes again... Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire. Revelations chapter 20 and verse 10. That God will create a new heaven and he also create a new earth. Amen? According to 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 13, Revelations chapter 21 and verse 1. When we come to the book of Acts chapter 2, verses 41 to 47, the list of things that are there that the church believes in. One, we, believes in, we believe in fellowship of the saints. The gathering together of the saints is a belief of the church. And that is why we gather on every Lord's Day to celebrate fellowship. We believe in the breaking of bread in homes and in temple courts. So we believe in the communion. That is why we gather the first Sunday of each month to the second Sunday of each month to celebrate the Lord's Supper here. And not only do we believe in the Lord's Supper alone, the early church believed in breaking bread in homes and then also in the temple course. So once a while, when we finish the service and we go there to take our breakfast, don't say that, what is this church doing? The New Testament church broke bread in homes and also in the temple course. This is our court. And so we can break bread here. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The church believed in prayer that prayer answers all things and it's a means of drawing closer to our Father and also to commune with Him. The church believes in the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit and we believe that God has given gifts to the church and also given the people who have gifts as a gift also to the church to do ministry in the church. 11. The church believes in the laying on of hands the Bible says that if anyone is sick, let them call upon the elders of the church, let them anoint with oil and lay the hand of faith and pray the prayer of faith, and God will heal the sick. So the church believes in the laying on of hands. Twelve, we believe in helping the poor. The Bible says that if after all your rejoicing and shouting, you see the poor and you cannot minister to them, what are you talking about? So we believe in helping the poor. 13, we believe in discipline. And just as the word of God is supposed to rebuke and correct, the church is instructed to discipline. Remember what Paul said, as a gentleman who is sleeping with his father's wife in the church, I want you to discipline that person before I come, because if I come and meet that man, there will be trouble. <laughs> the church believes in discipline. So once in a while, when the church is trying to discipline an individual, don't think that what is the church trying to do? The church believes in discipline. The 14, 
the church believes in sound Christian living. We consistently teach, and all the things we've tried to do the whole of this year and the previous years is only to help us to live the way we ought to live as God's people. Hallelujah. There are lots more that we can share when it comes to the general beliefs of the church. Let me narrow down to what we call the Baptist distinctives or the major fundamental beliefs and principles that have distinguished Baptists from any other religious body and through the centuries and even to today. These are things that we call the Baptist distinctives. And in trying to share them, I always try to use the acronym Baptist so that it helps you to remember and not forget. So what is it? B A P T I S T. Amen. Now when I use that it will always help you. When you are forgetting, you ask yourself Baptist, you put it back again and see what is it. So what does the B stand for? The first for the Baptist. B means biblical authority. Baptists believe that the Bible is the only rule for faith and practice. Amen? When you enter a typical Baptist church, there are two things that, is prom that are prominent. You always see the pulpit. And we always make the pulpit central. In some churches, the altar comes before the pulpit, isn't it? Ours have the pulpit in the middle. It is not even on the side. It is always where? In the middle. Because we believe that the Bible is the central authority for rule of faith and practice. Because these days we don't have too many good auditoriums, a few things have changed. But if you go to some of the churches in Europe and in the U.S., besides the pulpit, you find the Lord's Supper table, which is always a place in front of the, the pulpit. And in most of those churches, you will find the Bible, the big pulpit Bible, which is opened. And it's always open. It's there. Because we are projecting that the Word of God is the center of everything that we do. Amen? Amen. And this has basis in Matthew 24, 35, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, and 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Biblical authority. Our authority in doing everything in the Baptist church is the word of God. So we are not interested in what happened on the stock exchange. You can use that once in a while in your illustration, but that is not the center of it. The Bible is the center. Hallelujah. Amen. So that is for A, B. A, in the acronym Baptist, stands for autonomy of the local church. The Baptist believes that every local New Testament church has the privilege to, be to, to have total control of itself. It is autonomous, and we also practice the autonomous form of church government. A system of authority rests with an independent, indigenous, self-propagating, self-supporting, and self-governing local church. I'm going to expand and unpack all those things. So, in a typical Baptist church, hardly do you hear that this is the lectionary or this is the almanac and every Sunday all congregations are preaching from the same text. Are you with me? We don't do those things. Every church is autonomous. In other words, you have the authority to govern the local church the way you govern it. We don't also do appointment of pastors as some churches do. You are sitting there, somebody from center says, hey, you go here. We are transferred. No, we don't do it. Because every local church has a certain autonomy. That you have a right to choose your leaders. You have a right to call a pastor. You have a right to do your things. And this is inherent in the three things that I use. You are self-propagating. In other words, 
Nobody is going to build BRWC for us. BRWC can only become more, increase in number and everything based on what we do here. Are you with me? So we propagate the, the, the gospel ourselves. Number two, the church is self-governing. That is what I explained. We govern ourselves. So leadership is within. Nobody from outside dictates to us. We have a right to choose our leaders. We have a right to choose what we do with our money. We have a right to do whatever we want to do here. There's no interference. The third thing that the church must be self-supporting. Everything we do here, the money must be raised from here. You can't sit here and say, okay, but what is the convention? What has the convention brought us? And why didn't the mission brought us? What is BWA doing? What is AABF doing? The church is what? Self-supporting. Amen? And so whatever we do in a local church, the money must be raised from the local church. Hallelujah. Let me say here that from the early 1990s, the Ghana Baptist Convention modified this distinctive a little bit. And instead of having total authority of the local church, we have modified it into what we call the cooperative autonomy of the local church. And what do I mean by that? By cooperative autonomy, we believe that Baptist churches who come together to form an association, an association that come together to form a convention, is one denomination. And therefore, when we gather as a denomination together in our annual sessions, in our association meetings, and we take a collective decision, that collective decision is binding on all of us. Are you with me? The collective decision. But aside the collective decision, the other things, you can do it on your own. Amen? So what are some of the collective decisions? We have all agreed that for our denomination to make progress, to expand, and for us to be able to do ministry as we ought to do, because this church alone cannot build a university. This church alone cannot run a hospital. This church alone cannot do all the NGO things and boreholes and all the things that we are doing in villages. But when we come together as a denomination, we can do all those things. And so we took a decision that for us to be able to run our denominational activities, every local church is supposed to bring 20% of your tithe and offering to the convention. And then 5% of whatever you get from your tithe and offering to your local association to run the convention and the association activities. So 25% goes off. The remaining 75%, whatever you want to do with it, go ahead. Are you with me? So that is how we have modified it. All of us come together to choose the president of the convention. And once the president of the convention is chosen, the president is the president of all of us because we all agreed to do that. We all agree to establish a university. And so we establish a university in Kumasi. It is our responsibility to ensure that that university runs. We have agreed to have NGO activities. And so we have all kinds of hospitals. In the last four years, we have added seven new hospitals to our facility. Now eight of them, a ninth one is in progress coming. And once we have established all these things, our responsibility to ensure that all these facilities run. Amen? Amen? We went into the Trocosi project ourselves. Nobody forced us because we had put a home missionary in Volta region, came back and told us something like this is happening there. We went in there in the early 90s. We worked there up to today. We realized that if we take the girls from the Trocosi shrines, what do you do with them? So we have established the Baptist Vocational Training Institute. We bring the girls there to come and train. And we, after their training, we settle them back into society. In the next two weeks, we are graduating some students. And some do hairdressing, some do uh, dressmaking, some do kente, weaving, carpentry for the boys. And when they are done, we set them off during their graduation by providing the tools, the tools they need in their various fields of vocation to go back and work. So if you have 20 girls, we provide 20 sewing machines. If they are doing hairdressing, we must provide hair dryers and all the things. 
Now, this is our collective work. And for each month that that project runs, we are putting in between 22 to 25,000 Ghana CDs every month to feed the girls because they come there with nothing. And we provide feeding, education, and everything to get them going. And somebody was asking, what is the convention you do using our money for? We are training some people. Are you with me? Praise the Lord. And that's just one of them. Uh, we go to villages, we drill ball holes. Uh, you saw the white people who are here. They are going to spend some time there. It's all part of the things that we are doing there. We are building classrooms. We are doing all kinds of things. All those things are being done as a collective body. Now, what benefit do I get out of it? When somebody goes to Kumasi and drives through Amakum and see a sign, Ghana Baptist University College, suddenly you are proud. That's my school. Amen? Or you go through a book called Ghana Baptist University College School of Theology and Ministry. Yeah, that's our school, our Bible school. We train our people here. You go to Tamale, you see Ghana Baptist uh, Training Center. That's where we train our pastors. You are happy. You go through Frank Edria, you go through the various places where we have hospitals. You are proud because we are Baptist. And it's our collective money that does those things. No church can do those things alone. If you go to a hospital in Aleregu, we attend to over 800 patients, outpatients every day. 800 outpatients every day. Apart from Tamale Teaching Hospital, that is the next biggest hospital in the whole of the northern region. It's a Baptist hospital. And so that is why we've changed that whole concept from absolute autonomy where I sit in my church and it's all mine. The money is mine. I want to do it. And so you find churches, they are breaking. And you know, all these church chairs are old. Let's remove them and bring someone, one man, one seat. And we do all kinds of things wasting money. We need the money collectively to do other things. Amen. Amen. So we've done with A, we've done with B. What is P? P means priesthood of all believers. Now, unlike the Old Testament where priestly functions were restricted to the tribe of Levi. New Testament teaches that every believer is a priest before God. And therefore, each believer has the blessed privilege of going directly to God at any time, under any circumstance, to bring his or her petition through Christ to God. In the Old Testament, the priest went into the Holy of Holies once a year. And he carried all our petitions there. And even when the man is going, we must tie some rope around him because if he's not careful, when he gets there, he won't come back. And if we wait for a while, we don't hear from him. We have to pull the rope because if we go there, we also die. In the New Testament, everybody has the opportunity to go before God. Amen? Amen? So Baptists believe that everybody is a priest. You can pray to God. You don't need pray for me. That is why most Baptist church, you hardly see pastors sitting now all day doing counseling. When I was doing my pastoral ministry work, in those days when I was in Maranatha, I did a research on pastoral ministry. I was interviewing some people. I went to one of these independent churches. And I went there to speak to the pastor. I got to his house. The whole compound was full. Thousands of people. I what is it? I said they are waiting for counseling. And while they are waiting, they have grouped them into groups and doing Bible study. I said, this man will die. The Baptist churches use the pulpit to teach, like some of the things we heard this morning. By the time you instructed people in the word, they hear the word. You pro your, our counseling is done through the preaching of the word. And after we've gone through all these things that we are talking about, how to study the Bible, how to pray, how to stewardship, blah, 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 all that thing. By the time we finish this whole thing, by the end of the year, everybody here is disciplined. Are you with me? Because you've been taught. So Baptists believe that all of us are priests. And so when we sit in Sunday school, we sit in circle. I can talk, you can talk. We are all looking through the same Bible. In some traditions, some years ago, the Bible only belonged to the priest. All of us were supposed to sit there and hear him. Whether what he told us was the truth or not, we went home. <laughs> The Baptists believe that everybody must have a Bible. We all open it. I speak from it, you speak from it. You share your thoughts, I share my thoughts. I believe that God speaks to you and God speaks to me. And so as we share our thoughts together, we all learn. 
But we also understand that even among the angels, there's an archangel. <laughs> Amen? So God has selected some people into an office, and they become our priests and our pastors. Hallelujah. But that does not mean that you cannot do anything. Praise the Lord. So P stands for priesthood of all believers. T, two ordinances of the church. There are two things that Baptists uphold, the ordinance of believers' baptism and the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. Again, let me take you back to a traditional Baptist church. In most Baptist churches where the buildings are built originally as a chapel, as a temple, you find these two things there. Number one, as I said, you see the pulpit. In front of the pulpit, you have the Lord's Supper table. And it's not only there for show. And you notice that some Sundays there's nothing on it, but the table is still sitting there. Why? We believe in the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. And when you believe in something, you showcase it. And so in most Baptist churches, you always see this table right there to demonstrate our belief in the Lord's Supper. The second thing that you see in traditional Baptist churches is the baptistry. Behind the pulpit, you always see a baptistry there. That's where they do the baptism. It's of late that we are using auditoriums and things, so people go to Riverside and all kinds of places. But in all our traditional churches, you go to Calvary, you go to Tessano, you go to Grace, you go to Adenta, you go to Legon, all the baptistry, Typha, all the baptistry is in the church. And so right behind the pulpit, there's a baptistry. Some other churches have the baptistry in the pulpit. They have a cover on it, they put a carpet on it, but once there's baptism, they open the thing up and then you can have it. Now these two things are very clear because we uphold the ordinance of believers' baptism, and then also we uphold the ordinance of baptism, which is done by immersion. Hallelujah. Amen. And as I said, we believe that only believers are to be baptized. And so when you believe, then you are baptized. And then baptism is also by immersion. Amen. Number four, I. I stands for individual soul liberty with basis from Romans chapter 14, verse 5 to 12. That Baptists believe that each person has the privilege to think as he wills and that he is totally responsible to God. Now, this distinctive teaches that no person, institution, organization, or convention has the authority to tell a person what to believe. And so we don't force you as to what you believe. And that is why sometimes you see some differences in Baptists. General Baptists and particular Baptists, and they are all those, but we all believe in the same immersion. We all believe in salvation, but by faith. We believe in all those, but you find a few things that people sometimes argue on. You go to some place, they say, we don't recognize women, uh, what, uh, pastors. You come to Ghana Baptist Convention, we have already ordained and several of them already. All right? We have the opportunity to sometimes think and believe but the responsibility of those beliefs is upon you, that you one day stand before God and account for those beliefs that you uphold. And so when we have some forums like the All-African Baptist Fellowship and the Baptist World Alliance, we accommodate these minor, minor changes in our various conventions and denominations and also local churches. So you may go to, let's say, a Baptist one local congregation where they say that, as for here, we believe that when the women are praying, they must all cover their hair. All right? And then you come here and the women have their hairs free. Say, ah, but when I went there, okay, that is the, what they want to do. Leave them. But they are responsible for what they choose to do. Hallelujah. Individual soul competency. But as I said, keep in mind that along with complete and total freedom comes the responsibility of such a privilege. That those beliefs and things that you uphold and hold on to, you are responsible for them. Amen? And you must be careful how you deal with them. Sometimes, some people take these things to the extreme. A friend of mine who was a colleague of mine in school when I was in the U.S., we stayed in Richmond for three and a half years. He never had a membership in any local church. When he finished seminary, he could not be employed in church. And the only reason is that when he gets to a church and the pastor says one small thing that he doesn't agree with, he's gone. 
I said, you live in a world where there are all kinds of divergent views. So once in a while, even if you are preaching and you slip, like Donald Trump slipped and said, I, I, I was supposed to have used not, and then he didn't use not. <laughs> he will leave the church that same day. But as a Baptist, sometimes you make room for these divergent views once in a while. Hallelujah. S stands for separation of church and state. The early fathers, as I mentioned, spoke about the separation of church and state. That the church must be independent of the state and the state must be independent of the church. So Baptist churches don't take monies from the government of Ghana to run our church. If the government wants to support some of our social action program, that's a different matter. But in terms of running the church, we don't take money from the state and we are not a state church. And so even in the US where Baptists are all over, the it is not a state church. But you go to some countries, uh, like when we were in, in Zurich the other time, the state collects money and the state gives money to the church. In, some, in Germany and others, some people pay tax and part of the tax goes to the church to run the activities of the church. The Baptists believe that there should be a distinction between the state and the church. Now, this distinction must be done in three fronts when we talk about separation of church and state. Number one, we believe that there should be ethical separation. And when we talk about ethical separation, that each individual believer is to be separated from the world and unto Christ. According to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, as a Baptist, you must be ready to recognize that we are in the world, but we are also not of the world. Amen. So don't live here as if this is your home and you are going to be here forever. While we are living and working and enjoying and causing Ghana to be prosperous, one eye is on that trumpet that it will sound one day and all of us will live here. Hallelujah. And so there is a need for that ethical separation to understand that we are part of this system but we are not here. Amen. Number two, there should be what we call the ecclesiastical separation. We are to separate from apostasy just as the Lord has his church. Satan, the imitator, has his false churches. Amen? So you need that ecclesiastical separation. If you are part of the church, stay in the church. And don't be messing up. Now you are not sure whether some people are in the church or they are fit somewhere else. If you talk about separation of church and say that separation must also be there. Then there is a third area of political separation. The Baptists believe that Christ taught in Mark chapter 12, verse 17, that there should be a separation between the church and the state. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and give to God what belongs to God. Now that extension must be clear. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let me deal with the last one for the sake of time, and we will end it here. The last thing is, that is the T. So we've talked about what? B for biblical authority, A for autonomy of the local church, P, priesthood of all believers, T, two ordinances of the church, Lord's Supper and baptism, I for individual soul liberty, S, separation of church and state, and the last one is that there are two offices of the church. Baptists recognize that there are two key offices of the church. And these offices are the position of the pastor and the position of deacons. And so in all our churches, we run with pastors and we run with deacons. These are the two key positions of the church. And this is, has basis in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 13, and the book of uh, Titus. If you read chapter 1 to chapter 2 of Titus, you see all these things. So in the local church, these are the two key positions that are at play. The position of pastor and the position of deacons. But let me say that according to New Testament scripture, deacons are supposed to support pastors in their work of ministry. Deacons are not a board to preside over a pastor. 
In the old tradition, we used to call them deacons' board. Ghana Baptist Convention has changed it. Now we call them the body of deacons, no longer deacons' board. When you call them deacons' board, they transition from the corporate circle and bring it to the church. And so, when the Lord has called a pastor to lead a church, and you have deacons who are supposed to become supporters of the pastor and to help him now become his board. Anything that the pastor wants to do, if the deacons don't approve, the pastor cannot lead. So who called who? <laughs> Amen? The role of deacons is to support the pastor to do the work of ministry. So you assist the pastor in terms of his vision, in terms of the things he wants to do, and to help the pastor to do the work and do it effectively. So these are the two key positions that are recognized in the church. But besides this, in most churches, we have the body of deacons, we have the pastor, and then we have a church council. Because we have autonomous way of running the church, there is a need for us to come down to make sure that we have very good representation when it comes to decision making. So in most churches, the church council is made up of leaders of identifiable groups within the church. So you have the pastor, some of the deacons, you might have the, church, the leader of the youth, the leader of the women, the leader of the children, the leader of the, uh, the women who are represented there. You may have a music ministry, so you have one person representing music ministry. You may have various ministries in the church. You have different people from there representing those area so that when the council sits to take a decision which has sometimes gone through the pastor and the deacons and coming to the council you are able to have divergent views and representation from the whole church so that when we take a decision that decision can be carried and carried properly amen so church councils are meant to help us to facilitate our democracy in the local church in most churches what happens is that deacons are supposed to assist the pastor when it comes to ministerial duties. Amen? So, what are they? In preparing for the Lord's Supper, the pastor cannot be sitting here and be pouring wine, 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 wine when he has spent time to pray. So, the deacons are supposed to come and prepare those things and set the table. When you have finished, the pastor will come and pray over it. And then when we are administering it, you see here the pastor stand here and does all the things and then other people will come and carry out all the things and do them. So that's their responsibility. Number two, caring for the aged. There are old people in homes in some of our churches who cannot even come to church. At the end of the service, the deacons and sometimes the pastors, if they are available, go home and administer communion to them in the homes. You visit the sick, you visit the poor, you take care of those needs in the church. Those are the things that deacons are supposed to do. When they fail to do those things, they become a board and they want to sit in the office and give instructions. So they are supposed to be made to work to do those things of ministry. And once a while they teach, once a while you assign them some responsibility that the pastor cannot carry out. So deacons are responsible for the ministry aspect of the church. The church council, in most cases, is supposed to be help support the pastor in the administrative functions of the church. We are building a new church. Pastor cannot be running around looking for tipper trucks to bring sand. So members of the church council, out of them, maybe has somebody there who is from the trustees or who is in the building committee. That person takes up that responsibility. So after we've taken the decision, the administrative, what are the things that ought to be done? The people will chase those things and get them done and report to the pastor so that we can get the work done. These are the things we do in the local church to ensure that the local church will thrive that things will go on and go on as the Lord has commanded us to do. I'll bring this teaching to a close here, but I think I believe, I believe I've given you enough to think about. So when you think of the word Baptist, keep it in mind. Biblical authority, autonomy of the local church, priesthood of all believers, two ordinances of the church, individual soul liberty, separation of church and state, two offices of the church. Hallelujah. And when you keep the acronym Baptist, you will never forget these things. And you can stand anywhere when we ask you what makes you a Baptist or what do you believe. These are things that you can uphold. 
And so when you come from, let's say, one congregation uh, where they have, for instance, the presidents of what they call what? The session. All right. We will call it what? A church council. So somebody say, but why don't you have a session here? We have something else that represents that. Are you with me? So we have our own way of identifying those things. And it's important for you to know these things. So as we make progress, with time you will see that the church will be shaping. And then all these officers and all those other things will be coming in gradually. And then we will see where our position is and some of the things that we ought to do. Let me pause at this moment and open the floor if there are questions that are on their minds. There's a need for clarification. I will look at all those things and then we'll go. All right. I see some laughing there. So there's something in that head. <laughs> All right. All right, let's hear Pastor Alex. As we say in Liberia, thank you plenty. <laughs> uh, my spirit is rejoicing because our denomination, after several years of abandoning some of the things that make us who we are, is being brought back into it again. Amen. It has been something that has always been on my heart, that when are we going to go back to the old ways? Today, I can see that coming directly from the president himself, the president of the convention himself, I know it will simmer down to the rest, including those of our churches that are in the hamlets, the villages, and wherever. Church, let us take these lessons seriously. Baptists, we are distinctive people. God bless you. Amen. We're grateful for those comments. I think when the media team did the promo on, on Facebook, we saw all kinds of comments. People were saying that, why are you doing this on a Sunday morning when we are in our churches? We wish that I had been there. All of us want to be there. And so uh, we decided to go live as far as this teaching is concerned. So we're live on Facebook. But at the end of the day, it will be loaded onto YouTube. We're right. on YouTube. We are live on YouTube now. So it will be loaded on YouTube so that uh, people can follow it. It will be there consistently for those who want to learn to learn. Thank you very much. Is there a question from there? I saw laughing faces there. <laughs> and when I see those, I want what is in the head to come out so that we'll hear you. <laughs> All right. Are you OK? All right. Thank you very much. If there are no questions, is there one? OK. Thank you very much. When uh, you were talking about what do we believe as Baptists, you elaborated on 14 points. Out of the 14 points, I realized that you never mentioned anything about prophet and prophecy. Does it mean that the Baptist church does not believe in that particular ministry? Uh, all right. I, number 10. I said we believe in the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The prophecy and the gift of the prophecy is part of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so we believe in those things. Uh, I don't think of late any Baptist church will tell you we, we don't believe those things. We believe all those things. Except that sometimes we are cautioning our churches to be mindful of the excesses and the practices and the of late, so many gymnastics are coming along, and uh, we want it to be as decent and clean as possible. Because when the law speaks, I don't need to color it to become God's word. You know, when God speaks, God has spoken. And sometimes, uh, even instead of standing in front of you and saying, my children, my children, that's say the Lord, I will come here and say something simple and leave. But I believe that if it is God's word, it will have effect. 
you know. So let's, we believe in those, sometimes the excesses and some of the practices are the things that we teach uh, about. But I'm sure with time we will talk about some of those things in some of this, this forum. Great, let's hear also from. Two things. One is a question. Uh, I think there are people uh, misinterpret a certain thing that I want you to clarify about. One seed, forever, seed. forever seed, <laughs> and then, and then also, uh, we see that uh, most of our churches, as you said, uh, don't know that. We practice certain kind of governance mm. as against other ones. So uh, a lot of our members are confused. Mm. So I want you to just uh, give us a hint of what. Right. The first one will take more time if I deal with that. So I'll, I'll reserve that. Uh, the principle of one saved, forever saved. As part, it's inherent in the uh, traditional belief that we are saved by grace. Uh, uh, there are three things that we use. We are being saved, we are saved, and we shall be saved. Hallelujah. So the Lord, once you become genuinely born again, the Lord keeps us in him until the day of redemption. Hallelujah. And all of us should have this confidence in us. Uh, sometimes, some people are not sure of that. And so when you go to another church and there's a powerful evangelistic preaching, you ask people to accept Christ, they walk forward again. Another evangelist comes and preaches a powerful one, then everybody's coming up again. The Bible says that he who comes to me, no one can take him out of my hands. So once we have trust in the Lord, we stay in him. Hallelujah. Uh, we'll take time to expand on that. The other one is uh, our system of governance. Because the Baptists believe in, uh, I don't want to use the word democracy. Uh, I, want to, I want the right word. But let me use the word democracy. We have a democratic form of governance. Also. Because of our self-governing system, congregational, sorry, congregational leadership. So everybody in the congregation has a voice in whatever we do here. And so you notice that sometimes after service, uh, Bernard and Robert and others will gather you. We are all talking. We want to hear your views on this, on that, on that one. You know, other times we all come together, and even after I've spoken in some churches, after I finish, uh, who are you to talk? <laughs> but here we ask, give you opportunity, you can ask questions and all of those. It's part of our system of governance where it's a, it's a, everybody has a say in what happens in the Baptist church. But as I said, we do that with the understanding that the Spirit of God lives in you and the Spirit of God lives in me. And if the Lord speaks to you and the Lord speaks to me, when we collectively meet and we are under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, he will collectively lead us the way he wants us to go. Unfortunately, some people have taken this far, and that means that you can say anything in church. And so sometimes you see churches where people are lobbying and doing all kinds of things and mobilizing because, uh, uh, because we, when we vote, we vote this way without the leadership of the Spirit. But the whole concept of this whole idea of congregational leadership is the fact that we believe that the Spirit of God lives in you, the Spirit of God lives in me. So after I have prayed about an issue, after we have studied God's Word together, the Spirit of God will lead us to come to such conclusions that would be beneficial to God's church. And in taking every decision, the church and this progress is paramount to my individual uh, standing or position. So sometimes I may, the pastor may even go to a deacon's meeting or a church council meeting with some ideas. But the deacons may shape it 
and I used to talk about one of my professors who's going to be with the Lord. He's who told us in one of our classes that if you want to be a good Baptist pastor, you must learn how to work as a Baptist. And that whenever he had a, in his, he felt the Lord leading him to do something, he would pray about it, and after he's taking a decision, he will invite the chair of the body of deacons to, to lunch. And when they finish talking, he will put his proposal before and say, I brought you here. The Lord is leading me to do this. I did not bring you to come and uh, uh, throw it away, but I brought you here to help me to polish it. Amen? Then they will talk. You know, our position is that this is the thought. How do we polish it to make it effective? Amen? But not to throw it away. For instance, uh, we are thinking about what? Buying a vehicle for our sector head, and we are within the sector. So we brought the idea. It is not my responsibility to come and shoot it. Now, I don't have a car, so why are you buying a car for somebody? We are doing ministry. We need a car, so what do we do? We put our heads together. If we use this approach or that approach or that approach, we can get the car. Can we do it this way or that way or that way? So at the end of the day, we take a decision that moves the church and its ministry forward and not to destroy it. And so you find in some churches, Baptist churches become divided anytime there's a business meeting. Because people are there, and for a whole year, they have not voiced their feelings. Everything is pent up. I'm waiting for the business meeting. And in the old days, when there was a business meeting, and you see people sitting at the far back, you know there's trouble coming. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's where the missiles are fired from. <laughs> you know. But the idea is not to shoot down. The idea is how do we build God's church and cause progress. So let's learn these things that our system of governance of congregational leadership brings everybody into the congregation and everybody has a say. But how do we do this then for the expansion and growth of the church instead of destroying and tearing us apart? If I have a divergent view, articulate it, but do it such a way that people will understand what you are doing. You know, I've had people come to me and say, that, uh, President, I mean, the Constitution gives you power. Why are you not using the power? You should use the power. I say, hey, hey we are Baptists. Take, take it easy. <laughs> I don't have the power, but I know what it means to Baptists. So go back to them, sell your vision, sell your ideas, articulate it such that people will buy into it. And when they buy into it, you go along with them. Amen? It is much more helpful than to appear as if you are forcing people to do something. When they do it gradually, it doesn't help. But let's keep this in mind that any time an issue comes up and as a congregation we are trying to take a decision, remember we brought the, that issue here because I believe God's Spirit lives in you and God's Spirit lives in me. And if we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us, He will lead us the way we ought to go. Amen. Amen. Right. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And I trust that the Lord through this series of teachings will carry us uh, to the next phase. Shall we pray together? Our Father, we are grateful to you for the opportunity to sit at your feet and to learn from you. We come before you as a Baptist congregation this morning to learn at your feet and to desire to do the work of ministry and to bring effectiveness into the things that you've called us to do. We pray this morning that Lord be with us and give us grace to do what pleases you in every aspect of our lives. Bless us as Baptists in this country, across Africa and across our world, that we will be effective in serving you and doing the work of ministry. As we leave here this morning, we commit ourselves into your hands. Take us safely back home. Give us the needed rest for the rest of the day. Renew our strength as we begin another week. The Lord will be totally sold out for you. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much and God bless you.